One of the oldest debates in component selection for PC building is air cooling versus liquid cooling. Other than the obvious buyer advice that people seek, this is also an interesting topic because of one key thing. A really bad liquid cooler can cause catastrophic damage, which gets a whole lot of attention online, while a really bad air cooler will mostly just not work, but not actively harm other parts. For the most part, liquid coolers are safe for use, and we have them in most of our test benches, but the times that a liquid cooler is bad, it's really bad and it gets a lot of attention. Reliability is one angle that we'll talk about today, but we'll also be focusing on thermal performance, time to steady state temperature, noise normalized performance with each cooler's own stock fans set to 35 dBA, and more. Our hope is that this will help you answer some questions before buying your next cooler for your PC build. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-lit thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermals significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. So we're testing on different sized IHSs, different thermal loads from the CPUs. Our testing here won't be just one Noctua cooler versus a random liquid cooler. We're looking at a wide selection of both. We recently published a deep dive on our new thermal testing procedures for coolers. Air coolers, liquid coolers, doesn't matter. It's got a lot of really key points. So there's a separate piece on that. If you want to learn about the methodology used for this content, it's all in there. There's also an article for it if you want the written version. Separately, this discussion altogether of is one better than the other, each of them is better than the other depending on the scenario. And we'll go through numbers to show which is best in air quotes, for straight thermals, and we're gonna talk about the practical side of things too, the reliability side of things. It's also, again, frustrating that people want such a bloodbath between liquid cooling and air cooling products because it's, it's a cooling product. And the, the level of emotion people seem to express in their angry internet comments about why someone else is an idiot for using a cooler that this particular person didn't use, it's insane. It doesn't make any sense. So uh, most of the people who make those comments have no idea what they're talking about and you should ignore them. So each of these things has legitimate use cases. We'll go over those. We're going to embark on proving which is better in quotes for thermal testing, but there's more to it than that. And a couple of key areas of consideration for this content will be as follows. One, thermal performance. This is the primary talking point, primary evaluation. Point two, time to soak or time to max temperature. This is a new test we've added. Ease of installation, the clearance of things like PCIe slots, big downside for large air coolers, RAM slots, and case compatibility. And that's a, a problem for both products, depending on what you're talking about. Longevity is another one, or points of failure and risk. At the end of this content, we're going to talk about the major forum arguing point of reliability and failure rates, because this is also something that's often discussed. The first chart is a new one. We haven't seen focus on this before, so we'll explain it briefly before putting the chart on the screen. We're calling this one time to max, representing the time required in seconds to reach steady state temperature on the CPU. To measure CPU temperatures in our later charts, we use a reading averaged across a couple hundred cells of data once the CPU has stopped climbing in temperature and has stabilized. This is known as steady state or in our instance, the point at which the temperature is mostly stable and stops moving around. We allow about 23 to 30 minutes for this, depending on which CPU we're using. It's a fixed number for each CPU. And we found that this amount of time is sufficient for coolers of every size to reach steady state. One thing that isn't shown is how long it takes for those coolers to reach steady state. Here's the chart. This measurement is simple. We plot the second to second measurements across the entire test suite. Then we use spreadsheet formulas to determine the point at which steady state is reached. We have a lot more coolers than this tested for the later charts for thermal data, but here we're only looking at the new metric, so it's a bit more limited. The time is seconds taken, subtracting the known idle period prior to start. The Deep Cool Assassin 3 and Noct with NHD 15 are both large air coolers. They both required about 87 to 90 seconds to reach steady state temperatures, or their averaged peak that will be presented in later thermal charts. The 280mm Kraken X62 didn't reach its maximum peak temperature, which is also lower, mind you, until 260 seconds after the load started, or about 4.3 minutes. 
that's long enough that a bursted workload will calm down by then. And most workloads, like gaming, are bursted. They're not actually 100% CPU load constantly. They'll bounce between the CPU and the GPU. So you'd end up at a lower temperature than the air coolers for that work period, in the very least. The CLC360 takes longer than the X72 to heat up, specifically because of its higher overall temperature, resultant of poor static pressure from the fans. The amount of liquid gives the CLC360s, which the X72 also is, extra room to soak some of the excessive heat load that its fans, in the case of the EVGA product, have difficulty dissipating. But it's still, for EVGAs, a bad solution at this noise level of 35 dBA noise normalized at 20 inches away. We'll talk about this more shortly. This is the biggest untold story of air versus liquid. The time to max temperature is significantly longer on liquid coolers to 240 millimeter sizes and higher as that liquid takes a while to warm up. So this is a potential upside, but it's one that most people won't really realize in their daily use. It's still important to point out though. The test coming up will use the AMD R9 3950X CPU, a 16 core solution with a fairly high thermal density given the IHS size. The test bench has been configured to run at a fixed frequency and voltage with vCore at 1.219 get and vSoC at 1.063 get. Power into the EPS 12 volt pins is about 200 watts for this workload and other than power leakage, it's relatively unchanging. This one is noise normalized for 35 dBA at 20 inches distance in a room with a noise floor of about 26 dB. Anyone doing liquid versus air without normalizing for noise isn't really doing the test justice since then the winner is just going to be whoever has the fastest, loudest fans for the most part. We'll have those tests too, if you care, but you need this one to make sense of anything. The whole point of liquid cooling, after all, is that it can theoretically be run at a quieter noise level while maintaining similar performance to air. Let's get the chart on screen. Remember, this is noise normalized and it's using everyone's stock fans, so it's about as fair as it gets for a performance comparison. The big liquid coolers lead this chart with the big air coolers not very distant. The Corsair A500 continues to act as a lesson that a cooler is only as good as its contact with the device being cooled. It falls behind at 61 degrees Celsius over ambience or about three degrees worse than the Noctua NHD15 air cooler and about seven degrees worse than the NZXT Kraken X62 closed loop liquid cooler at 280 millimeters for the radiator size. If you want to know more about why the A500 is as bad as it is, we have a review on it but it primarily boils down to an unlevel cold plate that we previously demonstrated in this scatter plot. This plot from our A500 review shows the cold plate levelness. The A500 doesn't efficiently transfer heat at higher heat loads, but it blends into the background at lower heat loads. Overall, it's definitely worse out of the bigger air coolers tested, so this probably isn't the best representation, but it shows the low end. Back to the new chart, the EVGA CLC360 proves good only at higher noise levels, which we'll see later, but it struggles at these lower noise levels. Its fans don't have the static pressure required to overcome the radiator as competently as the Kraken X62, partly because the CLC360 has more loss out of the sides of the frame, and 120 fans have to run faster anyway to compete with the 140s and pushing air through a radiator at lower speeds. The X72 also has a static pressure issue here, ultimately matching the X62 at 35 dBA. Note that these results reshuffle around a bit on the Intel HEDT platform later, where we raise the noise level to 40 dBA, allowing a higher RPM. The NHD15 is about 4 degrees Celsius worse than the X62, which we've long favored among liquid coolers. That'll get you a couple megahertz out of a Ryzen CPU, and it will afford you slightly more overvolting or overclocking headroom, but not enough for either to matter too much for daily users. As anyone with experience actually testing coolers can tell you, these results are expected. Large liquid coolers should perform better in an absolute and technical sense, and they do. The bigger note is that you could run the X62 still quieter and match the NHD15. If you normalized for thermals instead, you might be able to drop the X62 to 33 dBA instead of 35 and match the D15 at 35. We didn't try that explicitly, but that's about what these results say. And it's uh, another takeaway for the differences in what temperature really means. It's not always performance. It can also be just lower noise. So then, no. Big air coolers are not thermally better than big liquid coolers when both are set to the same noise level on a 200 watt load. For pricing, the NHD15 is closer in price to the EVGA CLC280. 
but that's another Ace Attack unit that we've tested with high performance overall. It's one of the better ones actually for the price. The Kraken X62 is obviously way more expensive, and if you're just looking for a reasonable but not the best performance solution and you don't care about looks, and if you're not worried about RAM clearance, case side panel clearance, or the top PCIe slot, then the D15 is better value than the X62. They target different markets though, and that's half the point of this content. The X62 is clearly RGB infused and wants to go after that market, but it also fits in more ATX cases, even at 280 millimeters. And it won't cause clearance issues with the slots on the board, the RAM, or the PCIe slots. The D15 targets those who prefer old faithful performance and want to spend less. They're both good. It just depends on where you use it. In terms of strict thermal performance at an equal price, we would need to come down to a 240 CLC to check for that. And we can move to our older HEDT chart for that testing where we have dozens of liquid coolers for comparison. We've just run the D15 and the Assassin 3 for this one. We recently partitioned our Intel HEDT CPU cooler thermal chart into a soak chart, which measures across a power load dip that's intentional, and a peak thermal chart. Because we're testing air coolers versus liquid here, we'll only be using the steady state chart. The soak chart is only meant to help see how well the differently sized tanks handle the power load fluctuations. So this isn't useful here since we're trying to compare air and liquid, not just liquid to liquid. Normalized now to 40 dBA rather than 35 dBA and tested in a larger IHS from the Intel HEDT series, the Noctua NHD15 ends up roughly equivalent to a Corsair 240mm H100i Pro. That's what we expected. Thermal performance of the D15 when normalized for noise levels is about the same as a 240mm CLC of a similar price class. The H100i series is one of the oldest liquid coolers on the market and it has models that come down to about $100. The EVGA CLC240, priced at $100, runs at 44 degrees versus the 47 degrees of the D15 on this particular bench. Remember that IHS size and die spacing will have a difference on thermals, so this won't translate to every platform out there in an exact linear fashion, but it should be a pretty similar hierarchy overall. We don't think the CLC240 is particularly worth it when considering the CLC280 is $12 more, but you can watch our review for that. As far as translating to other platforms, things that would matter and can change the performance stack would be monolithic dies versus multiple dies, like Modern Ryzen or Threadripper versus monolithic Intel or Intel HEDT. The IHS size also matters, but ultimately the IHS size also is uh, outmatched in terms of performance delta by the dip in the IHS, if it's concave or convex, and how the cold plate matches that. We'll talk about that in a moment though. The D15 ends up overall outclassed on this particular IHS, this thermal load, and this monolithic die, but it's still not bad. It's just not meeting 360 mil performance, unsurprisingly, and it's about seven degrees away from peak 280 mil performance with the H115i Platinum at about 40 degrees, as is the X62. The X42 performance is nearby as well, but it leads into our next point about cooler design and what they're meant for. Cold plates are designed for different types of coolers. Acetec, for instance, designed its CLCs around Intel CPUs because their cold plates and pumps made the biggest strides before Ryzen came out. Acetec's older generations of cold plates were concave, which would better match the CPU IHS curvature, of the time anyway, and the two surfaces would fit together flushly once the mounting pressure was applied. Mounting pressure was considered in the building of these, and there was a known flex in the cold plate as a certain amount of pressure was applied. Asetek's larger cold plate also guaranteed every bit of larger HEDT IHSs would contact it, and there'd even be some spillover for extra soak. The microfins inside the cold plate are what really matter though, and these cover almost the entire area of the HEDT CPU IHS, at least non-threadripper ones, that's a different story. It covers more than the die area of the CPU, and so they're once again matched well to certain cold plate designs. Gen 5 Asetek designs moved over to a flat surface and got rid of the tree-like concentric rings that older Gen 2 cold plates had. All of this is to say that you could optimize for any type of CPU you want as a manufacturer, and you're going to have some benefits there versus companies who prefer to generalize rather than specialize, or who specialized in something else. Neither is better or worse, but Asetek did build its original designs at the height of Intel CPU popularity, for HEDT in particular, and so we're not surprised to see the lead grow in this test. 
these liquid coolers are still in the lead on Ryzen, just less significantly. And that comes down to the IHS design and the die layout. Moving on to the 100% fan speed tests on the AMD R9-3950X, we now stop normalizing for noise and start allowing coolers to perform at full bore. For some, that's deafening, like the EVGA CLC360 and its 60.4 dBA noise measurement. It's the coolest by a long shot, about 4.5 degrees cooler than the already cool X62 at 51.5 dBA. The more acoustically reasonable X62 runs at 51 degrees Celsius over ambient which has it three degrees better than the Assassin 3. The Assassin 3 measures at 54 degrees while at 46 dBA. The Noctua NHD 15 comes out looking more balanced with its 44 dBA result of 55 degrees, but it's also technically at the bottom of the chart. The word technically is key here because realistically, the difference between 55.2 degrees and 51.2 degrees is enough to account for a couple megahertz on a modern GPU or CPU but not enough to create a meaningful performance change in your application. We'll move to the R73800X at 35 dBA now. Remember that we're changing everything with this. The core count drops from 16 to eight, the frequency changes from 4.2 to 4.3 gigahertz, and the voltage changes to 1.287 volts get. Remember also that our goal is to generate heat. The actual overclock is irrelevant, just the heat that it produces in watts, about 200 for the original testing and somewhere closer to 117, 120 to maybe 123 for this, depending on how much power leakage there is from the cooler. This CPU is running at a lower power but higher voltage across fewer die, across fewer cores. So the point is that you can't compare the results to the 3950X results. For this one, we've already collected some additional data with the Noctua NHU-14S and the Noctua NHU-12S, which are single tower 140 and 120 mil coolers, respectively. We talked about these in our A500 review if you want to learn more. The Kraken X72 and X62 remain about equal at this noise level, like previously, and that isn't a surprise. The X62 runs about 3 degrees cooler than the Assassin 3, 4 degrees cooler than the D15, and similar for the A500 to the D15. As we showed in our Corsair A500 review, this lower heat load benchmark is realistic for a lot of users, but it also doesn't exaggerate the difference between large coolers as well. That's amplified by the NHU-14S performance, which is functionally equivalent to the larger air coolers tested here because of the limited power load going into the cooler. The larger coolers just aren't leveraged as much as in the 200 watt test. Still, the liquid coolers retain a technical lead, and the NHU-12S shows that there is a point of fall off where you'd want something better. And even still, if you might upgrade later, overclock, or have some reason to need the higher end coolers, it's important to at least know the numbers of what's better at the higher end. Finally, our last thermal chart looks at load temperature on the 3800X with fan set to max speed, again running at different noise levels, so this isn't the same as the 35 dBA test. The X62 and X72 lead the chart at about 50 degrees. The 72 seems to run at the lower end of the plus or minus 10% standard pump speed variation, whereas our X62 runs closer to the middle. So this is maybe part of the performance delta, but if we look at our HEDT test bench, which we're not gonna put on the screen for this, but you can see it in our other reviews, the X72 runs at about one degree cooler at max speed, which is within variance of the 62. Either way, regardless of which bench we use, they're within error of each other and are functionally equivalent. The Assassin 3 large air cooler and NHD15, alongside the horridly inefficient and loud A500, are all about two to three degrees warmer at full speed. The NHD15 remains one of the most efficient operators at max fan speed, although with this lower power load, the NHU14S looks potentially better, depending on needs. It's not enough heat load to really push the large towers, but the liquid coolers still benefit from the reserve of water and the efficiency at which they move the heat away from the CPU. The question of liquid versus air has always been pretty simple, but people really seem to become cheerleaders for one or the other, and it's a bit of a weird mentality. Here's what it boils down to. Ultimately, in the strictest, most technical sense, roughly price for price, liquid is going to be, in large air quotes, better than air. But that doesn't mean it's better to buy. It just means that the temperature is going to be at least a couple degrees lower if you're noise normalized, maybe more if you're not noise normalized, if you look at the CLC360, for example. So air coolers, even Noctua's air coolers, they're not magic. They can't beat the laws of physics. And a lot of people seem to think that they can because of bad testing. The reality is that they're good air coolers, 
but they're not going to be better than a good liquid cooler. There's really bad liquid coolers out there. There's really bad air coolers out there. But if you put good air cooler versus good liquid cooler, in the worst cases, they're going to be about equal. And in the best cases for the liquid one, they're going to be a couple degrees different. But I have a couple of things here. We'd almost never recommend certain CLCs. A lot of the low-end Cooler Master ones have had issues with leakage in general, and that's a matter of the CLC in particular, that specific design having a problem. Uh, we wouldn't typically recommend 120 mil CLCs. They're almost never a good deal. They're typically way overpriced for what you get. They're typically garbage performance, and you can get better for a small tower, like an NHU-14S or 12S in most instances. So 120s are mostly out. We would only really recommend lightly using those if you're doing some specific small form factor PC build that just can't fit something else or you need more than a uh, short tower. 140 mils fall in the same bucket for that. Both are contingent upon special cases. As for 240 and higher, once you account for getting an actually good product, because again, both exist, liquid cooling is going to lead, but it's primarily better in taking longer to heat up. This may or may not matter for you. Uh, if you don't know, then it probably doesn't matter for you. And it also just doesn't get as hot, but we're again talking a couple degrees different. So, uh, and you might also be able to normalize for heat if you wanted, and then you're at two to three dBA different. So those are your main differences, it's kind of acoustic or thermal to a very small amount, and that's about it. The bigger differences are the most obvious ones. We'll start with air coolers. Large air coolers are going to be more restrictive for PCIe, slot clearance for the top slot, side panel clearance in terms of protruding out of the case. Uh, they're going to be more problematic with some of the memory that's on the market, like taller memory. And installation is typically a bit more annoyed with air coolers, especially on desktop platforms rather than HEDT, where everything's excellent to work with, and uh, take a bit longer. So all that said, you typically only install a cooler once or once every few years when you build a new system. So installation is not really a huge point of consideration, but it's more worth mentioning. There's a big misconception that liquid coolers have a high failure rate, which is also largely incorrect. Liquid cooler failure rate is universally pretty low, but it's made more bombastic by videos, including some of ours, covering the most catastrophic failures. For instance, nearly 100% of Enermax's LickTech 2 line for Threadripper will fail at some point. That's a high failure rate, but that's because of the company being cheap and not using the correct coolant. Asetech and Coolit, or CoolIT, supply most CLCs and also have units and server farms around the world. Their deployments number in the millions and include extreme environments like extreme cold or extreme heat. Liquid cooling is reliable and overall has a low failure rate, and most failures are not catastrophic, meaning they don't typically explode and leak in a system. The most common failure would be pump failure, but even that isn't that common. People just think it's common because of confirmation bias. Either they want to believe it's a higher failure rate because they have some bias, or they're exposed to more media, even including ours, talking about unit failures more than unit successes. And there's an obvious reason for that, too. When we review a video card, it's a one-off instance. When we review a liquid cooler, it's a one-off instance. We'll only really revisit that video card in the counter example if there's some dramatic failure because you don't typically, as a user or as someone in media, really go back to talk about something if it's, well, it's been in the system and it's working fine. Because what do you do with that? That's not really content. Once people install the thing, they expect it to work. That's like what it should do. So you don't really want to give praise for that because then it's just doing its job. It's doing what every product should do, which is continue to work under circumstances for which it was built. But when something catastrophically fails, you obviously want to condemn it or bring attention to it or get the problem fixed. So we don't make videos talking about how all of our test benches and all of our production systems have been using liquid coolers since basically forever. And we don't really talk about how some of the high-end units that we have in deployment on test benches haven't failed in six to eight years. All that said, we get to the point in favor of air coolers. If you want something firmly reliable and with limited points of failure, an air cooler is obviously going to, well, in most instances, be that product. Liquid coolers, despite having lower failures than what is perceived, will still have higher failures than air coolers. There's a lot involved. It's not just a difference of there's a fan and a pump, so there's one more point of failure, the pump. It's a difference of there's a fan, there's a pump, there's liquid, there's permeation to consider, there's corrosion to consider if the manufacturer used the incorrect liquid, there's 
uh, issues of the percentage of glycol if you're using it in a more extreme environment. There are a lot of things to consider with a liquid cooler that make an air cooler just a lot simpler. And that's a completely valid, very strong point in favor of air. All liquid coolers will eventually have their liquid permeate the tubes, even the really good ones. So at some point, typically, it used to be five years, now it's six or so, but it's a bit nebulous because we haven't hit that point for most of the good ones that are new yet. But it's an expected six year lifespan until you start having extreme permeation of the tubes with the liquid. And at that point, you either have to refill it or replace the loop or the cooler, depending on what you purchased. So this is another point in favor of air coolers. A fan might have a usable lifespan of 17,000 hours at the low end to maybe 40, 50,000 hours at the higher end. And in that instance, you could take an air cooler from one system to another for a decade. And as long as you have mounting hardware or can make mounting hardware, that cooler is still going to be good. Whereas the liquid cooler will at some point have some kind of mechanical failure within it or will need maintenance to get the liquid back up to what it needs to be. So that's what it boils down to is air coolers have one thing that needs to actively not suck, which is going to be the fan, and then one thing that needs to passively not suck, which is going to be the cold plate. And once you've gotten both of those things in order, you plug it in, does the fan turn on, yes, no, once those both check the box, yes, you're pretty much in business and they're install and forget. As for us, we use liquid coolers in pretty much, actually in, in not pretty much, but every single production system we have here, and in every single test bench actually. The CPU benches, the cooler benches obviously are, are different. Uh, the GPU benches, the only one we don't use a liquid cooler in is the case test bench, which is for other reasons. So we trust them enough for that. People have this idea that closed loop liquid is scary and prone to failure, but the reality is it's scary and prone to failure with untested units. And there's a reason Ace Attack can cool it, the top two suppliers, are so commonly sourced, and it's because both of them have good failure rates. They're low. But there are very valid reasons to use air coolers, and uh, we very much like the air coolers as well. I'd like to use one in my next personal system build because I don't want to ever mess with the system again. I'm going to build it and leave it alone for eight years and run QuickBooks and Chrome. And so for that, an air cooler for me is great. Or if you just want something, again, that you don't ever have to think about, an air cooler is great. But at the same time, liquid coolers are technically thermally better if you are talking about a decent cooler versus a decent cooler at a similar price point, not the worst of the liquid coolers. Uh, I would say this, I think, in conclusion. Liquid coolers at the absolute low end are dangerous because they can cause harm to the system. They can break things. Uh, they can damage other components and potentially cost you a lot of money. Air coolers at the extreme low end will suck at their job, but they probably won't kill anything else as long as you realize they suck at their job in time. So once we're talking about the better stuff like we did in today's reviews, just buy whichever one you want. It doesn't matter as long as it meets the rest of the specs that you need. There's no firm better for everything. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more of this type of content. Go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you'd like to support us directly in this type of extensive testing where we try to provide a, a really detailed end-all answer for something. We'll see you all next time.